Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, this talk also would have fitted um, the session yesterday, I believe. Um, and um, this talk, you don't expect um, a lot of equations. Um, I'm really trying to show you some applications. Um, but the talks that you've seen throughout the week, I think, are um, a good preparation for this talk. Um, so I will not have to repeat what you've seen um, in previous days. All right, so this um, is a talk about reused auto modeling activities that we perform at the German Aerospace Center. Uh, this is not my work. This is work that my colleagues have done, and, and I'm acknowledging them here. Um, and um, just before I start, um, I'm from the German Aerospace Center. We are the National Research Center for Aeronautics and Space. Bernd. Maybe you would not be here if it were your work. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are also the largest project management agency in Germany, um, and we are the German um, space agency. Um, currently, we have about um, 9,000 employees, um, and we're still growing to um, about 50 institutes throughout Germany. Uh, and I'm from the Institute of Aerodynamics and Flow Technology, and there I'm the um, department head for the CASE Center. CASE stands for Center for Computer Applications in Aerospace Science and Engineering, where we perform, um, where, we, where we develop um, numerical methods um, and apply them to um, different challenging um, aerospace problems, including uh, aeroacoustics and aerodynamics. Um, one of my groups um, is dealing with um, surrogate modeling, reduced order modeling, um, uncertain quantification, uh, robust design, and MDO. Um, and we're also more and more using machine learning methods when this course was first set up. I think it was more focusing on the reduced order modeling aspects, which my talk is about, but I'm also trying to touch upon um, the machine learning part. And I think the course has evolved in that direction a little bit. So I hope this um, suits um, the idea of this um, lecture series. All right, so what I'm going to talk about is, first of all, a small motivation, why we are um, looking at um, these methods. Um, and I will talk about what we call the virtual aircraft use case, um, which is challenging. Um, we, um, I, will talk, I will try to connect these um, reduced order among methods to the principles of machine learning um, and show you some of the methods um, and how I, how I classify them uh, before then delving into uh, yeah, a quick introduction to our reduced order modeling approach. Uh, and the main focus really will be on applications, um, on the one hand for steady flow problems, and on the other hand for unsteady flow problems. If I have time, and this we will see, um, I will also talk about data fusion applications, which I think is really interesting to combine um, the best of two worlds, be it flight test data and numerical data, or uh, experimental data from the wind tunnel, or all three of them. All right, um, what is the motivation um, in terms of the virtual aircraft use case? Um, if you want to design and certify an aircraft, uh, you, need, you need lots of aerodynamic data, right? And uh, this data is needed throughout the entire flight envelope of the aircraft, right? So at cruise, where you're zipping your coffee, um, things are not very exciting. Um, and this is, um, we have a good, uh, we can take good care of this um, with the today's methods. However, um, you have to prove to the authorities that the aircraft doesn't break throughout the entire flight envelope. And you encounter much more challenging flow phenomena, be it separation, buffet, buffeting, um, flutter, um, you name it, and, and all of this has to be taken care of, and in particular this has to be taken care of um, also in terms of uh, the structural sizing of the aircraft structure, right? The aircraft shouldn't break during flight. Um, to do that, you need a lot of dynamic data, um, you need integral coefficients, um, you need um, distributed quantities such as pressure or shear stress distributions, um, both steady and unsteady. And um, all of this is coupled, right? This is a coupled system. Um, I'm dealing with the dynamic part, but we're coupling to the mass model, we're coupling to the flight control system, and in particular, we're coupling with the structural model. And there's some estimates um, to compute all of the different load cases and the data you need for performance uh, uh, evaluation of the aircraft and for handling qualities um, may sum up to um, the order of um, yeah, between 1 and 10 million different cases which you have to compute, both steady and unsteady, stemming from different flight conditions, right, different mass configurations, different maneuvers and gusts, um, gusts um, so what people call um, turbulence or what people call uh, air pockets. Uh, this, in truth, we call this gusts. Um, and different control laws have to, that you have to consider. So there's a large number of cases which you have to compute for each and every configuration. Right? So if the design is evolving during the design process, you have to repeat these computations several times. And to tackle all of these cases with high fidelity CFD or CFD CSM uh, is on the horizon, but it's not feasible. And that's, I think, the motivation for us to look into faster methods on the one hand, so things like double letter methods, um, but on the other hand, also trying to build reduced order models out of high fidelity data. Um, and as, uh, the challenge is to compute as little data as, as needed as possible. 
All right, and the goal is really then to predict all of these aerodynamic quantities based on parametrically generated high fidelity data uh, stemming from CFD or CFD CSM computations. Um, of course, hoping that these models which we are trying to build have lower evaluation time and um, lower memory storage than the original CFD. And the quantities of interest here are, again, um, pressure and shear stress distributions over the aircraft surface in particular, but we also may be interested in volume quantities. Uh, so the primitive variables which we're also dealing with in our CFD code, be it pressure, velocities, um, or temperatures. What parameters are we interested in? On the one hand, um, we are, of course, interested in flow parameters, such as the Mach number, the angle of attack, um, and this is shown here, different angles of attack for a profile. But we're also dealing with um, different geometries, right? And the design, the geometry is evolving, and we need to parameterize this geometry. And ideally, we have a model for all of these parametric changes, which is really challenging. So the typical process is to start um, defining a design of experiment, uh, to, to, to vary these parameters in a systematic way, uh, to compute these um, uh, snapshots. Um, I'm sure you've um, talked about snapshots during this week, um, which are typically full order solutions to the high fidelity problem. Um, and um, then the challenge is to build a reduced order model, um, whatever that is, um, which is a low dimensional description of the dynamics of um, the fluid flow around the aircraft which of course has a restricted range of validity, right? This we have to accept, we are talking about a prediction in terms of an approximation of the full order system. And this then can be used to predict at different um, parameters, ideally of course parameters that you haven't used to train the model. Um, in this case, an in-between angle of attack, for example. And um, the, what we're really aiming for here is, we're not always interested in really saving computational time. It may even be that we're spending more CPU hours than by just computing everything with high fidelity CFD. Um, we are trying to take advantage of the offline and online phase, as we call it, right? So you may, you may be able to start computing data parametrically on a big HPC cluster um, offline um, long before you actually know what you want to compute. Sounds, sounds strange, um, but this is called, um, in the industry, this is called an out of cycle design, right? You're kind of collecting data, you're trying to build up your database um, when not yet knowing what you actually want to design, right? And once your um, objective function, for example, becomes more clear, you just have to cast um, um, yeah, the data into that problem formulation and um, you can also reuse the data in case the objective function of your design is changing, right? That's one of the ideas. This we do offline, so we have the data ready um, once we want to quickly um, evaluate the reduced order model during design um, in an online phase. And ideally, this can be done on a desktop or in flight on the flight computer, on the computer that you take into the aircraft um, to make self-learning dynamic models. Um, and here's an example of a real-time prediction. Why right? this is not very fancy? It's only 2D airfoil, but this, um, this is um, yeah, the grid that you see. So it's an it's a RANS computation, uh, including viscous effects and transonic effects. And we're changing different parameters. We're also integrating the um, aerodynamic coefficients online in real time here. Right. So this is not too difficult. And in 2D, the, in 3D, it's more difficult to get a real-time capability. But I think this is quite impressive because we're also predicting um, the geometry deformations and the grid deformations uh, simultaneously. All right. Um, what is the connection um, to machine learning and the machine learning principles um, and reduced order modeling? Right? So this is my classification. This may not be agreed upon with, with everybody here. Um, so a lot of times um, people say, um, we talk about artificial intelligence. And when we talk about artificial intelligence, you know, we typically mean, mean machine learning. There are, of course, other branches like robotics, which we're also dealing with, but here I'm talking about machine learning. And um, I think there is two main categories of interest for us, and there's supervised machine learning, so predict, um, predictive models, right, based on input and output relations. Um, and there's unsupervised learning, which I classify as an internal presentation, representation only using uh, inputs. And um, there are different techniques, um, classification, regression, model selection, clustering, and in particular, which I'm just doing dimensionality reduction. And these are the methods that we use. Um, so the, the simplest one, which we have always used um, for a long time, is a classification message, which is called nearest neighbor. And I'm, I still think it's funny um, that one of the most successful machine learning algorithms that Netflix is using is um, nearest neighbor, right? We are also interested very much in regression models, right? So predicting um, values um, and methods we use are Gaussian process models. We're using Bayesian regression, very powerful tool. Um, different um, regression techniques, rich, lasso, kernelized regression. Um, and more recently, we're using uh, different artificial neural networks, and I will touch upon that later, and support vector regression. 
Um, we're combining this with dimensional reduction methods, in particular PUD, um, which you've heard about here. Um, we're not dealing with DMD yet. I'm, I'm interested in that. Um, we are looking at isomaps so and nonlinear dimensional reduction methods. We are doing manifold learning um, and interpolation. Um, we're using autoencoders and uh, lowering approximation um, and hyperreduction. Um, if you combine all this with clustering, then you arrive at cl methods like um, clustered PUD. ISOAP is also a clustering technique. Uh, at the same time, um, we're using k-means and spectral clustering and affinity propagation algorithms. To train all these different parameters, which then arise in selecting these different um, um, yeah, models and, and uh, methods, we're also using model selection algorithms such as grid search, which is very expensive. Um, of course, classical things like cross-validation. Uh, and hyperparameter tuning, also again, um, one of the most important features of what Google is doing is to efficiently um, train hyperparameters, right? And we're doing adaptive sampling. And again, you may, you may um, argue about this classification, but this is my classification, and just to give you an overview of the different methods we're using, and which I think are connected at least to what people today call artificial intelligence. All right, um, all of these methods are implemented in our own toolbox, um, and um, this is um, a modular object-oriented Python package for rapidly predicting lots of data um, based on high fidelity CFD. Um, the methods, um, some of the key features are that we can do these kind of experiments, um, we can do adaptive sampling, um, we do surrogate modeling, so classical surrogate modeling, but also in artificial neural networks where appropriate. Very interesting is verbal fidelity modeling, right? Having data of different quality and of different origin of different sources to combine that. May it be numerical data of different um, origin or may, may it be measured and numerical data. Very important for today's talk is dimensionality reduction and reduced auto modeling. And all of these methods are part of um, our flow simulator environment, um, which is a um, data backbone, so to speak, to exchange data between different plugins. And I will talk today about um, our flow solver plugin, the Tau code, which is the RANS code, um, and the SMARTY plugin, which is uh, the method or the, the toolbox to deal with um, reduced auto modeling and uh, machine learning techniques. Um, what is interesting is that um, due to the fact that we have the simulation core, which is running in parallel, we have also parallelized our yeah, machine learning and reduced auto modeling um, software where necessary. For example, the PUD part is parallelized and the residual evaluation, which we'll talk about, is parallelized. The code is partially differentiated, um, which is nice if you do optimization. Um, we're using, of course, established libraries like um, MKL. Um, we have interface to scikit-learn, very powerful. And of course, TensorFlow is being used um, for artificial neural networks. Um, we are currently working on the GPU, GPU version. A lot of these methods lend themselves to running them on the GPU, um, and you can do very powerful things on an aircraft in flight if you take a GPU with you. Uh, and we also have standalone versions uh, and use case specific um, adaptations. Applications uh, that we have used this toolbox for um, are related to optimization, so surrogate based optimization and uncertainty quantification, which together enable you to do robust design or inverse design. Um, today, I'm going to talk about mainly two things. Um, um, if I have time, um, fusing measured data and CFD data. Um, the next two talks will be uh, related to data driven determinants modeling, so I will probably not talk about that, only if I have time. Um, I will more talk about yeah, how to rapidly produce the dynamic data for the virtual aircraft use case that I introduced you to. Um, and I will not talk today about um, other important things like um, optimal sensor placement, right? So, using the snapshots you have to derive a modal basis and then find optimal sensor locations. Where, where, yeah, where you apply greedy algorithms on the modes. Um, I will not talk about wind tunnel corrections, which is very exciting, again, to combining two worlds, measurements and, and CFD. Um, but all of this is, of course, related to what we call virtual flight testing. You're, of course, trying to fly the aircraft in the computer. All right. Um, again, a second classification, now talking about reduced auto models in particular. Um, I will show you steady ROM applications and unsteady ROM applications. And I have classified um, the steady ROMs into non-physics based or non-intrusive reduced auto models. Right there, we're using dimensionality reduction methods together with interpolators or regression models or with artificial neural networks. And I'm going to talk about that a lot today. I'm not going to talk about manifold interpolation, which is very exciting. Um, but um, yeah, probably it's, the time is too short to talk about this. And I will talk about physics-based um, intrusive models. I'm not talking about the Jurkin models, um, but I will talk about our alternative approach, which is, which is based on residual minimization. In terms of unsteady ROMs, um, we, can, um, we have, again, non-physics-based ROMs 
system identification tools are being used, interpolators and artificial neural networks. Not today's topics. I will focus on what my favorite topic, which is physics-based, unsteady, reduced order models, where we use unsteady residual min minimization, and um, very exciting hyper-reduction methods um, based on the DIME method and the MPE, which all of you know. But to apply this to a real large test case, I think, is what I want to show here, because that's also posing a challenge in itself. Um, the most logical approach in reuse auto modeling is to apply Golovkin projection to linear systems, and we also have um, um, a reduced auto model of our linear frequency domain solver, um, which I'm not going to show you today. Also, it's um, of course interesting to combine this with manifold interpolation. <clears throat> Just in case you're interested, um, these tools tools are already in the industry, right? So. Um, I think we're doing a lot of um, interesting um, research here altogether, and uh, industry is really interested in applying this because they have really challenging problems um, ahead of them uh, where we can help. <clears throat> All right, so in a nutshell, <clears throat> how do we construct reused auto models? Um, we're first doing uh, a step which is called dimensionality reduction. And I will here focus on POD, which you've learned about before, so this is just some um, repetition. Uh, we're computing um, snapshots um, with the CFD code um, for different um, yeah, parameters, uh, input parameters X, um, and get the snapshots Y. Um, we build a snapshot matrix, capital Y, and then the objective is to find um, yeah, a low-dimensional subspace that um, best approximates um, the snapshots. And this is sometimes pictured like this, right? You have a cloud of data points, you're trying to find principal components. Practically, this looks like um, this. You have your snapshot matrix coming from different CFD computations, so n different computations. You're applying an SVD or an EVT to this, um, and um, you're, of course, typically trying to exploit certain um, um, yeah, features um, to reduce the problem, um, the computation time for the problem. Um, and then you arrive at the PUD modes, <coughs> um, the, single <coughs> the single values, and the right single values. And this um, um, is, of course, then giving you what is called the pod modes. And I've just pictured some of them here. Um, and this is also, in some cases, lending, um, they are lending themselves also to some physical interpretation. It's not always easy. And I think you've talked about this um, during the week. But it's not always that easy to interpret what you're actually seeing there. Here we are, of course, seeing different shock locations. And this is one of the drawbacks of PUD, right? We're basically getting, uh, in transonic flows, we're getting different modes for different discrete shock locations, which you have to try to combine to find a new approximate solution, and that's one of the drawbacks. So every snapshot that you computed can, again, of course, be represented by the PUD basis uh, in such a manner, right? You have pot coefficients A, you're combining them with the pot modes, um, and you can do that, of course, for all the different pot modes. And then, of course, the obvious idea is to try to find um, models um, be it interpolation models, regression models, or whatever, um, to predict um, the pot coefficients um, to then use the, um, yeah, the given pot modes to arrive at a new prediction. And that's what we show here. Um, the easiest way is to just interpolate for these coefficients A um, and um, then use a surrogate model. Um, and for an unknown, um, for an unknown, um, for an unknown um, input parameter set, uh, X star, you're trying to make a prediction Y hat by plugging the X, X star in your interpolator, and then you get new coefficients A, uh, which you can then com combine with your, or multiply with your um, pod basis modes to arrive at a prediction Y hat. I'm sure you have talked about truncation before, right? So, of course, typically the idea is to also truncate the modal basis. Um, it's not always clear how to truncate it, but there's some heuristic to do that. And after this really brief um, and short introduction to the approach, I want to delve into applications, which is the main focus here. And I'm talk first talking about ROMs for, for steady flow problems. So in a nutshell, what we're doing is we have different parameters, be it Mach number and angle of attack. Um, we define some uh, training points. Uh, we're systematically using different methods like Latin Hapi cube sampling, optimized Latin Hapi cube, um, and, and different methods. Compute our training data with a CFD code to arrive at different snapshots. Uh, and then we apply the dimensional reduction step, and I've just shown you PUD, but we're also using isomap um, and autoencoders to do, perform this step um, to then um, yeah, try to make predictions for the um, PUD coefficients or for the weighting of the isomap vectors, um, uh, or we're using residual minimization in the PUD subspace or in the isomap uh, subspace, um, or we combine these different approaches to find the model coefficients to predict then um, a flow, con flow solution 
on the surface or on the volume, the full volume solution, at an untried flow condition, of course. Here's an example of um, where we combine this idea with machine learning techniques on top. Right? So here the idea was to look at a full aircraft configuration uh, where we have computed Hive.ti CFD snapshots um, for four different design parameters. So the aircraft is changing geometrically, um, but we also have five different flight parameters. So flow condition parameters like Mach number, angle of attack, angle of side slip. And using a compressible inviscid flow solver, um, we computed some, together with Airbus close to 8,000 different snapshots. Um, and each snapshot um, on the surface corresponds to 10,000 grid points, right? So here we have the solution um, at 10,000 different grid points. And the first idea that we had together with Airbus 10 years ago was to build a surrogate model for every grid point. May not be a clever idea, but this is what we tried. Um, and this is a nice test case for um, evaluating machine learning algorithms. Um, and the idea was then to, yeah, to build 10,000 individual Gaussian process models. Um, and it turned out to be infeasible to do that because you have to tune uh, the hyperparameters of these models um, for, yeah, you have to tune, thousand, you have to tune the hyperparameters for 10,000 different models. Just infeasible. Also, we already um, have um, a very efficient Gaussian process implementation where we um, have the compute intensive part in Sison, right, for different correlation kernels. However, this was still not efficient enough. Um, and instead, um, of, we also went to the GPU, still didn't help. So instead, what we did is we looked at clustering. Right? So um, having the different flow solutions um, at all those different different points, we were looking at for similarities in the flow solutions on the surface. And um, to cluster the surface points, to reduce the cost of hyperparameter optimization, we looked at spectral clustering methods and affinity propagation algorithms. And then what is interesting is to see that um, this even physically makes sense and you can interpret what's happening. So if you choose three clusters and just apply these dumb machine learning algorithms to the data, um, yeah, you find these three clusters, right? And this, to the analysis, this makes sense. Um, you seem to find um, a cluster on the wing and partly, which is partly extending to the fuselage, right? Which is the part of interaction between the wing and the fuselage. There seems to be a fuselage cluster um, and there seems to be yeah, probably something on the engine. So this, this can be interpreted, right? So this is great. Um, when you go to 10 clusters, well, it's still, there's still some features that with the, the fuselage seems to be very insensitive and more, more very connected in terms of the data, all makes sense. Going to 300 clusters, as we did in the end, um, it's not cannot be easily interpreted anymore. And, and that's, I think, this is the power of machine learning, right? Um, you're throwing data at the methods, um, and to some extent you get insight and you can still understand what's happening. But if you go to very large data, um, as a human, you are just impossible to find correlations, right? And this, I think, is the strength of these methods. There are skepticists um, to just believe in these methods, um, but I think um, uh, I was very impressed by uh, MIT colleagues who um, came up with new antibiotics, right? And given the current um, epidemia or pan pandemia that we're facing, I think finding new, new vaccines, new, new antibiotics um, with machine learning is great. This is helping humanity. And then I'm not questioning what's been happening there. Okay, um, this is just an example of um, where we're applying these clustering techniques. Um, and um, in the end, it turned out to take, um, to take 380 clusters was the best choice here. And this is just um, showing you um, here the, um, the wing, um, the solution, the surface pressure distribution on the wing um, for um, three different approaches. Um, we have um, the, the reference full order model in red um, in terms of the pressure distributions at four different section cuts here through the wing from top to bottom, so the outer wing to the inner wing. And um, we're comparing this reference solution in red with um, classic Kringen that I just introduced you to, and we're comparing that with um, PUD with interpolation, so where we really build one model at every grid point, so 10,000 different models. Um, and the first thing we see is that um, the two different reused order models, which are shown here in green and blue, um, seem to give very similar solutions. There's a small problem here on the lower surface, so this line here is connected to the lower surface of the wing, and this is basically where the clusters meet, right? There is something missing in terms of a boundary condition or an interface condition between the different clusters. Otherwise, this looks pretty good, um, and we're saving lots of computational time. However, uh, and that's the main drawback of PUD here, um, the real shock location, which is um, shown here in red, and which is very, it's a very strong shock, very far off on the wing, as you can see here, is not being predicted by any of these models, right? So, so that, that's not that good, right? So what's happening there? So let's look into this here and let's see what remedies we have for this problem. 
Um, and one of the rem remedies is, um, we believe, um, for example, ISOMAP. It's a method which was, um, for us, I think, published in Nature. Um, and it's stemming from the image processing community, right? So they were interested in, um, well, um, yeah, in face recognition. Um, and um, yeah, you have very sharp contrast. You may have very sharp contrast in, in pictures. And this is kind of how you identify different people. Uh, and this is very similar to um, finding shock waves um, in a flow solution, right? And we thought, okay, this may work here as well. And so what you do is, um, to, in a nutshell, you're um, computing solutions um, of the full order model in your Frontwick space, be it angle of attack and Mach number, for example, in our case with the tau code. And then um, you can, um, yeah, uh, th these solutions lie um, on a manifold in, in some solution space, right? So this is the solution space here, and you can see the solution manifold here. This is the so-called Swiss roll example, just to illustrate things. And every point on this cloud um, is one CFD solution, one snapshot, right? And what is interesting is, um, let's, let's take a look at this um, flow solution and this flow solution. If you are computing Euclidean distance between these solutions, this would be um, following this, this path here, right? Which is, of course, not lying on the solution manifold. However, if you're taking um, geodetic distances, which you can compute, um, then um, you've, you, you're able to um, follow this, um, um, yeah, to follow um, the solution manifold and how it evolves. And this you can take advantage of with ISOMAP to then um, find a low-dimensional embedding of all of the snapshots uh, in which you can then, oops, I have to progress here, in which you can then interpolate, right? So you kind of try and connect your um, input parameters to the no-dimensional embedding of this data. And once you've found that, um, you can then make a prediction for a new point in the space and do a back mapping um, back to the um, full order solution space. And um, this is called a nonlinear non non dimensional reality reduction method. And what, what's happening here? What, how does it work? We've applied this to, um, again, a wing um, test case. This is, um, I believe, the land wing. Um, and this is um, Euler computations, um, so inviscid computations. We've performed um, altogether 25 different computations for um, changes in um, Mach number and angle of attack, um, so yeah, more or less random. Um, DOE. And the idea was then to predict um, for this um, uh, point here, shown in red. And um, on the one hand, we used all of the black samples, all of the black data snapshots, all 25, um, and built a PUD based reduced order model. And um, on the other hand, we tried to use ISOMAP to find the seven nearest neighbor on the solution manifold right? and use these for the prediction. And the first thing that is interesting to see here is that the nearest neighbors that were selected um, by ISOMAP are not the nearest neighbors uh, in the Mark Alpha space, but the nearest neighbors on the solution manifold. And um, again, to the physicist, to the anamicist, this seems to make sense, right? Um, they know that um, yeah, it's not uh, the the flow physics evolved nonlinear in the Mark Alpha space. So you can you can I wouldn't I wouldn't have guessed which ones to take, but kind of what you see afterwards um, seems to make sense. And um, what is also interesting is that when using these seven snapshots, um, they are much more related with the, um, the solution you want to look for than, for example, the um, snapshot down here. Right? This, uh, this snapshot down here has nothing to do with the prediction here. And this is also what the method tells you automatically to not include um, data which is not relevant for your prediction because it completely messes up your prediction. All right, so we have done this prediction here based on these two methods, and we're combining PUD and ISOMAP with interpolation for us, so PUD interpolation of interpolation of the pod coefficients here and uh, weighting of the ISMAP um, uh, snapshots, the selected snapshots, to make predictions. Um, and here I'm showing the, the surface prediction, but it's more interesting to look at three different section cuts. Um, and they're shown here in the CP distribution um, over the chord lengths. And again, here we show in, uh, in black this time the reference solution and the very strong shock um, at these locations here. And then PUD combined with interpolation is giving you the green, um, yeah, the green line here, and you can see that upstream of the shock we have uh, a way too strong um, yeah, increase of um, way too strong decrease of pressure, uh, and also we have um, a yeah, step function built into the prediction, which is very typical of PUD because it's a linear subspace method. However, um, the Eisman method um, is capable of predicting the shock location and the shock, shock strengths pretty well because it's only trying to use data which has to do with the prediction. Zooming in a little bit into the shock location, 
Um, you can see this much more clear, right? Um, the shock is um, well predicted in terms of strength and location. And um, we can then also plug this solution into the solver, right? So we, we, we're trying to now also optimize the pod coefficients rather than interpolate them by plugging the solution into the flow solver, minimize residual by varying the, the POD coefficients, and then you can further improve the solution. This is shown here, right? You're getting an even better prediction in terms of um, the shock strength and location with the same POD, sorry, with the same isomap snapshots. You, do, you can do the same, of course, with POD. I skipped the, the runtime here. This is just to show you. Um, Building the model is rather cheap. Um, making a prediction with both isomap and POD is, is even cheaper. Uh, and compared to a full order CFD solution, this is on the order of um, yeah, four orders of magnitudes um, cheaper. <coughs> All right, next example um, is um, we are, of course, also interested not only in changing flow parameters such as Mark and Alpha, we are also interested in changing um, the geometry, right, to arrive at some optimization capability. So here I have a full, full 3D aqua configuration and um, we are looking at the wing and we are twisting the wing. So kind of we are at different section cuts, we are twisting the wing to find the best twist distribution, which is aerodynamically very important to get good performance. Uh, and there are five different um, sections where we are changing the twist. And then the idea is to build a reused order model for the aerodynamics um, due, to due to these geometry variations um, at, again, a transonic Mach number, which is our favorite hobby to predict transonic flows. Again, we're trying to, com to, to compare PUD and isomap here. Um, and this time, we are adaptively sampling the snapshots based on the isomap embedding. Right? So this is also an interesting idea. Just go back one slide, maybe. So if you have computed this embedding, right, you can also look at where are the largest um, holes in this embedding, right? And the idea here is to compute additional snapshots